Good morning, Idaho. Welcome to the local Yokel Idaho podcast, where we talk about what is going on in the wonderful state of Idaho. For those tuning in for the first time, we like to have a little banter before we go into the stories, but I understand if you're short on time. So we have provided the timestamps in the description so you can jump straight over the stories you're interested in. Welcome back. I know it's been a week or so since we took our break. Hope you're all doing well. It has uh, been both a relaxing, I know for John, not having to do quite as much, but also busy for me because as you will see later on in the episode, little tease there, um, we've been working on a lot of cool stuff uh, leading up to this. But before I get any further, speaking of which John is joining me again today. Hey Tyler, it's good to be here. I'm glad, glad, uh, glad to be doing this again. It's always a good time. Oh yeah, it's always a joy. Which hopefully you've been having a wonderful time over that break. <laughs> yeah. So fun things in my life. I, you know, I talk about nothing really happening in in my neck of the woods. <laughs> but uh, baseball season has started. So That's my right. My oldest is playing ball, and I am I am umpiring. So I had my first game or first set of games this last week, and definitely caught my fair share of pitches. So that's fun. <laughs> How were the games? <laughs> oh, they're good. They're good. They're you know the kids are good. Um, you know they're some of some of them are better than others. There are a lot of errors that happen, but you know it kind of is what it is. It's just what you expect with kids playing sports. I probably guess there's also a bit more of some emotions there because as we well know when we're younger we might not have control of our faculties as much as when we get older. Yeah, kids kids get emotional about sports in in uh, very big ways. I, I guess the, the easier way to say that is kids experience big emotions and then we as adults learn how to deal with those emotions so we don't experience them right. quite as much. But yeah, man, their their reactions are raw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, even then, sometimes I kind of chuckle that it seems like those that do professional sports, it's still there. But generally, part of being an adult is that you have a bit more of a command over those. But either way, it's, it's always enjoyable to go to those and see that, especially when um, some kid really has a gift. It usually shines pretty bright at that level. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really fun to see the kids that are gifted that way. Um, I used to coach middle school and high school basketball, and it was it was fun working with those kids uh, because some of them were just fantastic. And so it was it was really fun to watch them use their 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 natural God given physical talents and then and then shape and meld that with the work they put into it to to grow and develop those talents into something that is more than it was. And it it's really fun to watch them do that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, there again, we're starting to also get to the end of my understanding of sports because um, <laughs> I, I was that kid that'd be like, oh yeah, I'll sit on the bleachers and I'll calculate what's the best efficiency of where you put everyone, but <laughs> put me on the field. Nah, I'm not, I'm going to pass. Right. The one exception, which is very, very true is like maybe some badminton or some golf or something. I enjoy that, but that's, that's a little less high stakes, high octane. That's more lay back calculated but uh you know it's all right. good, well, the good bad, badminton's one of those crazy ones i don't know if you've ever watched like the olympic badminton Not. but my goodness those guys are insane at that sport it's an it's an entirely different sport than you and i play if you and i were to go out and play badminton it's right. just it's a it's a it's a different game completely it's kind of like well, watching especially... professional ping pong players oh. <laughs> play ping pong yeah that, that is that is true. And I've seen some of like the ping pong matches there in China where it's just like, does the ball ever hit the ground? It's like going back and forth, which I mean, independent of sports. I know what I ended up doing with my free time is I went with a friend with mine over to the Mackey area, Arco Mackey. First time I'd been over there, uh, the sawtooths were just drop dead gorgeous. I think we ended up doing a total of like 600 miles that day. But it was it was really pretty to go into that part of Idaho. Granted, I will admit, as much as it was gorgeous, um, you you don't go there for the towns. It's more no. you're you're going there for me anyways for the photography to see it because I I love seeing that stuff. So right. most of the time, if you're travel, unless you're a person who's a really big outdoors person or a photographer, the amount you're gonna be over in that area probably is not a lot unless you're then yeah. going more eastern and then you're coming into Pocatello and uh, Idaho Falls and that area where there is a lot more stuff to see and do there. But um, with that, I know some of you probably are sitting on the edge of your seats like, get to the point. We are coming as we have teased. If you've seen the trailer earlier in the week that came out on Wednesday, a new format for the show where we'll be moving to full video for the first time. For those of you who are audio only listeners, you won't notice pretty much any changes. So with any further ado, 
we'll uh, be switching it over, which here we go. You can see me, you can see John. Um, and I guess that's that uh, for me. Obviously, I know what I look like, but for most of you listening for any amount of time <laughs> that don't directly know me from outside of shooting the show, probably don't. But also you can put a face to John. I know sometimes when I've listened to audio things, you build like a mental image of the way that a person looks. Um, yep. And then when you finally see them on video, you're like, wait a second, that wasn't quite <laughs> what I what I envisioned or what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, that happened for me with Rush Limbaugh back in the yeah. day because, you know, he was just on the radio. And I, I remember driving around or I remember being in my parents' car driving around listening to him. And so I definitely had a, a, a picture in my head of what Rush looked like. And then I saw pictures of him and I went, wow, I, I'm, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put those two pieces together to – to save my life. <laughs> and to this day, I have no idea what Rush Limbaugh looked like because. <laughs> yeah. I mean, another example of that is like when you listen to some of like your animated series or something, and then you see the behind the scenes and then you're like, wait a second, I've watched this character and my brain has it associated with this person. And then yep. you finally like see the actors when they're doing in the booth and you're like, sometimes it's almost weird that it fits. And it's just like, oh yeah, that works. Well, and that happens a lot with, uh, with cartoons where the same actor will voice various different characters. I mean, the, I know the Simpsons and family guy were famous for that. Right. And so to watch that one guy do all of those voices is, is a, it, yeah, it can be fun. Especially when you realize <laughs> that actors, they, especially even voice actors, they are physically still moving and acting and stuff, but it almost looks like their it almost looks like their head is locked on the mic. Well, as someone who's done a, a, a I don't know, a little bit of, uh, narration and voiceover work. Right. And there's a lot of gesturing that happens. There's a lot of talking with hands and pointing at things. And Which, I mean, similarly on that is that we're going to be moving towards having a locals page, which for any of you that have run into this, and I'm guilty of it with other creators and stuff, is, you know, they've got their Instagram and they've got their Twitter and they have their YouTube and then there's this and then there's that. And you're just getting to a certain point where you're like, Overload. Why can't it just be in one kind of centralized place? Well, glad you asked. That's what Locals is going to be for us, is that obviously we're going to post there on Twitter and um, on YouTube and Rumble and all those wonderful places. But if you want a place that you can be like, no, I want one place to see it all. I can look at the videos. I can see the different tweets. You know, that name, I swear, it's not It's not going to die anytime no. soon. No, it's not. They're <laughs> tweets. It's Twitter. But with that said... We're going to be, as I said, launching the Locals page. I might recap here a little bit, but uh, for those of you that don't know what Locals is, um, it's basically Imagine YouTube, which I know all of us are familiar with, and then Imagine Twitter, if you've ever been there. I know there's going to be less people that have had some experience with that. Um, the next closest comparison, I think, would like be Google Plus back in the day. Um, but you take like YouTube and Twitter, yeah, kind of like Facebook, and you combine them together to make kind of one thing. So... There's video formats. It's got a whole video player like YouTube. Um, you can leave comments and likes on stuff that we post on our community page there. But on the flip side, you can also see our posts and there can be polls and stuff. And one of the elements that's going to be really exciting for us and hopefully for you as well is that it'll give you an avenue to directly support the show. What I mean by that is that it has a paid tier system kind of similar to Patreon. So we'll have people, if you want to become a supporter, there'll be an X amount per month, I think think as of recording we're going to do ten dollars a month um i might change that but we'll probably do that and for the sake of the launch there should be a link in the description for a discount so you get one or two months free i'll have to check i'll figure out what i'm going to do on that I haven't quite decided oh that'd be nice and plus it'll help pay the bills here help us to do more cool content to uh, keep keep us employed <laughs> <laughs> which i know the banter was a little bit less of our usual bantering and a little bit more informative, but we'll move on to <laughs> our first story here, which should be a fun one. So starting off with our first story here, nuclear power is Idaho's future. Most people outside of Idaho think of the state as a backwater place, the place where only doomsday preppers and closed-minded people live. However, Idaho has been a pivotal player in one of the most groundbreaking technologies of the 20th century and possibly the 21st century. One that has given great blessings, but has also pushed mankind to be maybe a little bit more careful. In this segment, we'll be discussing Idaho's role in nuclear energy, specifically in nuclear power, 
and how it might be the future of power and how Idaho can be at the forefront of it. But first, we must examine Idaho's long history with nuclear power, which most people, including myself, are not aware of. So would you like to start off with that, John, the heritage that we kind of have here in Idaho with nuclear power? Yeah, so most of our state's nuclear history actually revolves around the National Reactor Testing Station, or INL, which stands for Idaho National Laboratory. The testing and laboratories were established in 1949 in the high desert of eastern Idaho near Idaho Falls. It's located between Interstate 15 and Highway 20 near where they meet. The complex spans over 890 square miles and holds the achievement of developing the first nuclear reactor to generate usable electricity, which is pretty awesome. That's kind of a big deal. In fact, the scientists at INL were the first in the world to power a city with atomic energy, in this case, the town of Arco. Granted, it was for a short time. And also not to mention the following achievements. So the advanced test reactor at INL can simulate years to decades of neutron damage to materials used in nuclear power plants in a matter of weeks or months, aiding in the determination of their safety. INL has been home to 52 reactors over its lifetime, three of which produced electricity, and it has assembled and tested the power source on the Mars Curiosity rover. They've also been the lead manufacturer of armor packages for the U.S. Army's Abrams main battle tank since 1984, and the prototype for the reactor used in the USS Nautilus. The first nuclear-powered submarine was tested at INL, and a total of four nuclear Navy prototypes were built at the site. And lastly, the laboratory has contributed to the development of more than 300 commercial nuclear power reactors operating around the world, with many tracing their roots back to INL. But when learning anything, you make mistakes, and INL is no exception. On January 3rd in 1961, an incident occurred at the stationary low power reactor number one, or SL1, which was an experimental reactor at the time. Due to the improper withdrawal of a control rod by one of the operators, the reactor went prompt critical, leading to a steam explosion and meltdown that resulted in the immediate deaths of three military personnel. This also remains the only fatal nuclear reactor accident in the U.S. to date. Another aspect of Idaho's nuclear history we have to consider is the fuel that makes the reactors tick. For the most part, that's uranium which is the main fuel used in nuclear reactors and comes from other states. And granted, Idaho has mined about 365,000 pounds of U-308, and one of the biggest producers of uranium is Wyoming, our neighbor. All that said, there is a new type of fuel for nuclear reactors that Idaho has a ton of. That would be thorium. Initially, in the early days of nuclear, it was passed over in favor of uranium because you could make weapons out of it, but you couldn't with thorium. That said, Idaho has the largest known concentration of thorium resources in the United States, primarily in the Lemhi Pass District along the Idaho-Montana border. The USGS estimates this area contains 133,400 tons of thorium oxide. So, Tyler, with all of this, what are we doing with it? What is INL doing right now? Yeah, so coming back to the present, INL has continued to work on researching and developing nuclear power. They're currently ramping up testing on small module reactors, or SMRs, and micro reactors, which have the potential to breathe new life into nuclear power. They are a type of reactor that is expected to use thorium instead of uranium. Plus, the Idaho legislature, which just finished and wrapped up here recently, passed Senate Concurrent Resolution 113, which is related to energy and nuclear power, is a non-binding resolution that expresses the Idaho legislature's position in favor of expanding our use of nuclear power as a clean energy source. Which, one thing I wanted to touch on with that is what SMRs are, just briefly, because it is important to have a complete picture of stuff kind of going on here in Idaho related to nuclear. In general, small modular reactors, or SMRs, work by using nuclear fission to generate heat, similar to conventional nuclear reactors, but on a smaller scale. The heat produced by splitting atoms is used to turn water into steam. This steam spins a turbine connected to a generator, which produces electricity, very similar to a coal power plant, just that fission is generating the heat, not coal being burned. SMRs are designed to be manufactured in factories as modules and then shipped to the site for assembly rather than being entirely built on site like larger reactors, which we're all familiar with. Their smaller size and modular design allows for more flexibility, having lower upfront costs, and they generally are considered safer compared to traditional reactors, which kind 
kind of brings us to our application here, which is with that understanding of nuclear history, what does it matter? Why are we even talking about it? Nuclear is something that we already know, right? It's scary. It's dangerous. Have you not heard about Chernobyl and Fukushima <laughs> and all the things that have happened with that, right? And the first part I would like to kind of point out is that is that we live in an age where, for better or worse, society wants to move away from petroleum-based energy. That's the thing that runs our gas engines. Um, that's the thing that it, it runs a ton of stuff in our world and powers it. But if we're truly trying to move away with it, whatever power source we do end up choosing to go after needs to be reliable, cheap, and clean. Those are kind of your three elements if you're wanting to do a power grid because you might have something that's reliable, but then it's super expensive um, and it's not clean or, you know, that would be everything against you there. But y you get the picture. You're wanting some tenant or balancing act of those. And each power source has its pluses and minuses. There isn't one that's like a silver bullet for all of those. There's usually some variation of the theme of something you're having to give away in those three. But kind of looking over the general options that we have right now, the first one is solar. It's not very reliable, but generally it's cheap and clean. The next one, which is all good and faithful, is coal and gas. It's not clean, but it takes the other box really well, which is being cheap and reliable. You can flip a switch and you can start up a gas or coal plant pretty quickly. Um, and they're pretty reliable and how easily they fire up. It's something that we've kind of perfected to a certain point here. Um, the other one that you've heard about is wind. It's not cheap and it also is not reliable unless you live next to a coastline where the wind's always blowing, which I, I don't know why you want to live there, but there again, I'm speaking from a mountainous area. Um, but, you know, they generally say it's clean. The other one that Idaho has invested in, and I think for the longest time has been the best option, sadly not everywhere can enjoy it, but here with our mountains, we are actually really greatly positioned for it, is hydro. It's clean and reliable. Granted, it's not as cheap as it used to be anymore because regulatory bodies have made it nightmarish to build any new dams of any major size. So that's why right now it's really not that cheap. And the last one you have, like we've talked about or getting into here, is nuclear, which for the longest time it hasn't been cheap, but it is very clean and very reliable. Right. But the objections to nuclear are that it's not safe. It's waste lasts forever. And man, if something goes wrong, we're all doomed. The problem there with that idea is that nuclear energy results in only 0 0.07 deaths per terawatt hour of electricity generated, hmm. which that number doesn't mean anything in a vacuum, but comparing it to other types of energy, oil resulted in 18.4 deaths, natural gas in 4.63, and coal for 2.82. So it's factors of magnitude more safe in terms of deaths per terawatt hour. Right. Which is a really good indicator that it is safe for humans. Right. And these numbers are also adjusted for the fact um, for any of those statistic nerds out there, these are just for the fact that, yes, there are less nuclear plants than there are coal or oil plants that are generating power. That's why we're measuring it on terawatt hours. We're not looking at how many different plants. We're looking at, okay, this plant generated this much power over the period it took to generate that much power. How many fatalities, which for anyone, I, 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 I hate to break it to you, but we live in a fallen world. There's death and we try to mitigate it, but it's going to happen. If you like it or not, with construction or anything, I mean, your car, for crying out loud, you're less safe driving in your car than you are an aircraft, but most people don't think about that. Um, right. If we want an empirical me measurement for when we're looking at our power, um, independent of how many power plants they are, that is the reason we chose that statistic to look at in this one. Well, but then if you look a little bit further, also a study by NASA found that nuclear power has prevented, on average, 1.8 million deaths between 1971 and 2009 that would have occurred from fossil fuel pollution and associated health impacts. We all know that coal power burns a lot of gas and it creates atmospheric Such. conditions that are bad. Also, mining coal is not good. We know that. These are these are things that we know. What we don't seem to or what what I don't know, the, the majority of the U.S. population doesn't seem to be able to wrap their heads around. And I think we're coming, I think we're getting better at this. I think we're right. coming to the point where people in mass are starting to realize that nuclear is a, a decent option, at least, um, is that it doesn't have those negative health impacts. Well, especially with modern reactors. I mean, we're going to see that yeah. in our next point here, but um, I'm not going to say that there haven't been issues with nuclear. We're not saying that at all. Example with the death, there is a zero point 
0.07 death rate, right? There there are fatalities and we could point to Fukushima, um, Chernobyl, which are the most notable examples. But well, and then on on U.S. soil, you often, you've also got Nine Mile Island. Nine Mile? Six Mile? Uh, I think it's Nine Mile. I, sure. I believe it. It sounds right. Six Mile sounds wrong. Um, but yeah, that um, those, one with the, the Chernobyl example, you're, you're, you're dealing with a communist government that doesn't care about its people. So the level of <laughs> running that thing correctly is not the main priority. Um, no. Another example uh, with Japan, I would just leave it at uh, Japan is an area that is known for having some of the most extreme forces of nature acting upon it. Um, and we'll just leave that at that. Yeah, the the sit or the the stuff that went on at Fukushima to make it fail was insane. I, it really I remember, was. I remember doing a dive into that and there were like, there was a whole string of things that had to go wrong and then not get fixed for it to fail the way it did. Right. It, and it, so statistically that is a highly improbable and highly unlikely situation. And also if they had done the necessary work to fix those problems as they occurred, then it wouldn't have failed even with the, the, I think it was a tsunami that hit it. Yeah. Well, I mean, on that, and even, you know, we can get in that discussion, I will agree with you that human beings are flawed and mistakes are going to happen. And so you're saying, well, yeah, maybe if it's that you you only, you cut it down to 1%, but when we have that 1% failure, then it means there's an entire area that's radiated, radiated and we can't do anything with. I would appeal to you, example, Elon Musk has done this and a couple other people. They've gone to the area near Fukushima and you, you can read the health reports. It isn't a yeah. barren wasteland. Yes, there is an area around the plant that is quarantined. This is true. But the size and footprint of that, and when you look at also the reports of the amount of effect it's had over the community over time of that accident, which was a very major accident, to be sure. Um, it, it, it's not this idea of that the entire town is now abandoned. Um, it's just the area around the plant has to be heavily controlled, and they're having to continue to just work on it. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, looking at other practical examples of uh, places or countries that use nuclear power, uh, we've got we've got two we've got two neighboring countries between France and Germany, and you can compare and contrast the two of them. So in 2022, France generated 70% of its electricity from nuclear. France historically has been the world's largest net electricity exporter, sending power to neighboring countries in Europe, see Germany. To account, since 69, France has had only six major nuclear accidents, the worst of which happened in 1992 when three workers were contaminated at a particle accelerator in Forbach after entering without protective clothing. These are the traditional reactors, mind you, not the new ones that are even better and safer. And you look at the cost of energy from France and Germany, and the difference is astronomical. Oh, yes. And, you know, as you gave an example, I didn't grab it there, but it probably would have good have been good notes to have. But I know I can speak this in good confidence. I just can't give the numbers. Germany does have the most expensive cost for power in Europe, hands down. And what have they done? They have gone full on with their nuclear and wind. I also know for a fact that they have regular rolling blackouts and issues and stuff because it's not reliable. Yes, it's clean, but that's not all you want with power. It needs to be clean, it needs to be reliable or, you know, clean is the part we're wanting, but you want that reliability and affordability there. It's really cool if you've got this amazing grid that's the cleanest and most reliable thing, but if no one can afford the power, why'd you even do it, right? Um, so it, it becomes that issue. And also it's something I didn't put in my notes here, but I know I can quote in confidence, um, is that the reason France has such cheap power, because you'd be like, well, earlier, Tyler, you said traditional nuclear was expensive and it is. But that's here in the U.S. Over in France, they came up with a system where they said, OK, we're going to figure out like three, maybe I think it's either three or two. You'll have to look this up, but three or two designs of nuclear reactors and they standardize them. So that way, if you're a nuclear technician in France, you only have to understand three different nuclear power plant designs. And those are the only three you'll find in all of France. And that way, parts technicians can be interchangeable and can easily travel from plant to plant and do work and different things. Rather than for context in the US, we actually have a system of every nuclear power plant is built custom. So a technician at X plant in New Jersey or something knows his plant, but if he goes and travels to a nuclear power plant over in Tennessee, he has to completely learn how their entire system works because it's not standardized at all. 
which also creates more cost. And you have these people that are very, 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 very specially trained. that can only be at one reactor, which there again raises the rates you have to pay those people. And so the cost gets more exponential rather than over in France, they have more of a standardized system. Yeah, they're a little more standardized, a little more modular, which which makes things work better. That also means that you can expand easier because you can train easier. Mm -hmm. You have more people who are able to train more people, which is just a good thing. Well, it's also the example of people wonder why Toyota is so reliable, right? They're known as one of those more reliable brands of car brands yeah. out there. Well, they might have a car, maybe it's the Tundra or something, right? And um, they're gonna release it stuff and it's got this engine, it's got this thing, right? But over time, yeah, they do upgrades, like maybe it's got this added turbo, or it's got more um, electric features or other things, right? But the core bones of that, they just keep tinkering away with it until you get like, if you get the last generation of a certain series of Toyota, it's going to be the most reliable because they don't change the platform. They take the thing, they that engine, they have worked with it for so long and worked out all the minor kinks. And so it's super, super reliable. Same example here. France has three standardized forms of reactors or two. There again, I can't remember it off the top of my head, the exact number. And they've just, for the past several years, used those same reactors and gotten very comfortable, kept improving, kept adding more safety features. And so they're super, super reliable and safe now which is something yeah. we could learn here in the U.S. as well. Right, which which brings that whole conversation right back to home, is why are we talking about nuclear power? Well, power is what runs our society. We, we need power. We have to be able to keep ourselves warm in the winter. We have to be able to keep ourselves cool in the summer. Especially here in More Idaho. More people actually die of heat than they do of cold in the world. Mm -hmm. And so dealing with heat is an important thing. So then the question is, all right, what does that do for us in Idaho? Well, we need to be able to produce power. We've done a lot of uh, a lot of hydro, but as you said, it, it's hard to build new hydro. So that leaves very few options in terms of how do we continue powering our society to reduce uh, carbon emissions, to reduce the impact and the imprint that our power facilities have on the the world around us right there there really aren't that many options left and man nuclear seems like it's a really good one right and i know one one thing that some people that are knowledgeable idaho will bring up is come on idaho is super geoactive you know you have a bunch yeah, of hot springs everywhere why aren't you using those why are you sitting here talking about nuclear say you're still convinced of the risks and everything with it. Why don't we use geothermal? And to that, I'd say, yeah, let's use geothermal, but we're we're capped at a certain level of <laughs> how many points we can access it. Obviously, a yeah. lot of those geothermic points are recreational areas. So you have this issue you're having to balance with now of, do you want to kick the public out of these areas that they could use for recreation, which um, if we've learned anything about Americans, we love our recreation. And then on the other hand, a lot of our geothermal often times is in weird spaces in the mountain, which it's kind of hard to build a giant like steam <laughs> generator and all that. And especially put it in a place where, okay, there's a ton of snow and it's cold and it's hard to get to and all the money yeah. and resources, which when you're said and done, that's fair, but the cost is gonna be super, super expensive to pull that off. And that's where coming back to the example and the reason I talked about SMRs or small modular micro reactors is with them coming online, there's a possibility of that cost for uh, nuclear to come down. There's also regulatory work being done in the US to get that modular system online for nuclear by different regulatory bodies here. Um, and another example is some people say the, the waste or the byproduct, we haven't touched on that yet from nuclear, that, you know, it, it's a waste, it lasts forever, unlike, you know, coal or carbon or maybe just broken solar panels, we can recycle them or something, right? That a lot of these reactors are one, if it's a uranium based reactor. Um, I remember reading a report here again, the waste from it, I think from like an entire year of a, a nuclear reactor, it's like, it's like that much. It's like the size of a basketball. And yeah, so it's, it's pretty easy to mine a hole and just deposit it somewhere in the mountain where there's already probably a lot of radiation or ores there as well. And it's not going to affect anyone. So you have that element. But if we're still concerned about that, as we talked about earlier, originally thorium was looked over because the Cold War was raging and we kind of wanted a bunch of uh, uh, nuclear bombs. bombs. Um, and so the idea was like, OK, wait a second. We want a bunch of nuclear bombs because there's a possible nuclear war, but we can also generate all this power and then at the same time be generating the rich uranium that we need for our explosives. Well, look, this is a win-win. We can have an awesome PR thing. Look, we're generating power, see nuclear safe. But on the flip side, we can have a limitless supply of ammunition if necessary. Um, and so they went that route. But 
coming into the 21st century. Obviously, that's not uh, nuclear weapons aren't as uh, friendly looked at no. as they were before. And thorium is looking even better and better. Yes, it has less. I don't want to say energy, but its radioactiveness is a little lower. So it makes it a little trickier to run in reactors that we're used to. But one of the cool things is the half-life of it, um, after it's been run through a reactor, it can actually, in some cases, the decay or uh, I don't know what you want to call it, cool down, but the point when it's not a threat anymore. Um, I was reading some article. It can be in the like in the decades, just maybe 10, 10 or 20 years before it's yeah. inert. Um, it's also something that you can't turn to weapons. So for people that are worried about, um, you know, some terrorists breaking into one of these small reactors and stealing it and then using it for terrorist purposes to build a bomb or something, right? And they can't do that with thorium. You, you can't get it to go critical. Well, also, if you talk about generating power worldwide, that's one of the reasons that we don't want other countries to be uh, studying and working on nuclear power. Right. But if we're, if we have if we have developed technologies that allow thorium to be used as a as a power or as a fuel, well, then we don't have to worry about those countries developing nuclear weapons because you you can't at least we haven't figured out yet how to use thorium as a weapon. Obviously, you can use anything as a weapon for anything, but have you ever heard the, how many ways you can use a spoon as a weapon? It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I had a friend. Uh, is this where we insert the clip of uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham? <laughs> but why a spoon, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a friend. He went through the whole class and stuff to uh, be like a prison guard. And one time he looked at me. We were eating, of course, while I was eating. Um, and he, I was using a spoon. He's like, you realize how many ways you can kill a person with that? And I'm like, what is it? It's like, it's like 27 or something like that. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah, spoons. They're deadly. Deadly weapons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should ban all spoons don't, now. Don't put them in your pocket. Yeah, right? Can't use spoons. Sorry. We're going to chopsticks <laughs> now, okay? Can't. No. Bugs I don't with know how chopstick is better. It's a stick with a pointy end. I know, right? <laughs> like, that's that's the literal definition of a shiv. <laughs> Imagine that the political correctness gets so bad that they're like, in prisons, we need to make sure they have chopsticks because only they're using chopsticks. the spoons as a weapon and they're labeled as that or whatever. And then everyone's just looking around like, why? I, really? Wah. Really, guys? Yeah, that's that's funny. Uh, oh, but, man. Anyway, nuclear nuclear power. Yes. Go for it. Yeah, and coming back to that, that with that example, if these reactors, which INEL is testing up to this point, it's been a lot of private testing, but that has been making news because basically the, the, the people that started nuclear power in the world are starting to test and do work on SMRs. So there's a lot of hope that they'll be able to crack it and figure it out and make it profitable. So it'll be interesting to see what platform they end up working on it. The thorium reactors work on like a molten salt. But the cool thing is when, and I'm learning out a little bit here, when you're talking about the small ones, um, the cool thing is that you can have the reactor and it's suspended and then if any issue happens since they're smaller and also since uh, thorium's not as active the whole reactor can literally just be dumped into a, a, a cool like yep. salt bath so it doesn't matter if there's no power it could still cool and not go critical some of them are even designed in such a way that without power they can cool themselves um that the minute that power goes off to them they start cooling down in a sense for their maintenance purposes um yeah. which also increases that safety size also you know if something were to go wrong even with all those safety features when you're talking about small modular reactors rather than the big ones if you have a big bomb you have big problems. If you have small bomb, less big problems. Kind of the same <laughs> equation there. If you have a small reactor, the chance of having something like a Chernobyl yeah. or uh, a 12 mile you're, island you're, or whatever, what was it? Uh, did we say nine? nine? Nine, 12, six, five. I know it's not eight mile because that's <laughs> that's uh, the street right. where Eminem didn't grow up. <laughs> right. So it, it, it decreases um, the potential for that. And grounding that all here in Idaho, we have both the research institute to do it. We also have the desert to do it. So if people are worried about it being near people, um, we have this wonderful desert to go put things out in. And the mining ability to go get the material. Right. And we have burn. the resources, let alone the mining capability. So in a theory, yeah. Idaho could be self-sufficient 100% for a power with nuclear which I don't think there's much places in the world that can make that argument that they have both the raw or the manpower and the area to put it down. Most of the places, even if we're arguing for the place of uh, thorium, they have to do it or any nuclear, they're going to have to do it outside of their state or outside of it to get those resources to come in. But Idaho could be a helping factor in that. And also, I was say, be on our own. also that's another export that Idaho can figure out is if we can figure out how to do 
uh, thorium-based nuclear power plants really well, then we can sell the technology and we can then sell the fuel. So here, have this wonderful piece of technology. Also, you probably want to pay me to give you the material to use. To make to your thing make run. It, right? This seems, this seems like a great salesman's pitch of why we should study this. Right. Right. Independent of just the history here. But the main reason, if I'm being honest, yeah. that I started on this story was because of that Senate resolution that passed or concurrent yeah. resolution that if we're sitting there and we're saying, well, the public sentiment is there. No, we've seen the legislature, which is an expression or a downstream byproduct of the culture that the Idaho legislature is even encouraging. Obviously, it's a resolution or yeah, it's a resolution. So it doesn't have any binding authority or something, but it does give a certain level of this is the direction that both the legislature wants to see go, which is kind of an expression yeah. of the people. So it'll be interesting to yep. see how this progresses. And I think Idaho is really, really situated in a great spot for it. Hey there, since you made it to this, you probably enjoyed the show. So don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe. And if you want to see all of our content in one place and want to support us, we recommend you check out our Locals page. Also, for our audio-only listeners, please rate the show and leave us a review. Thank you for your support and for being part of the local Yokel Idaho community. Together, hopefully, we can keep Idaho informed, engaged, and involved in this wonderful state. Now, let's dive back into the show. Which kind of transitioning from uh, nuclear, which has its own connotations and into something that's more close to Idaho, planting in Idaho. Typically here we're diving into Idaho history or breaking down political stories in the state. But I wanted to touch on something that's close to many Idahoans hearts, gardening. It also seems to be something that people from outside of state love to do as well. But as many of us know, and we'll see next week, Idaho doesn't always have the most normal weather. <laughs> so in the interest of this, in this segment, we'll be discussing when is the right time to plant your garden in Idaho and some rules of thumb you should follow. If you're a gardener from out of state, hopefully this will be helpful for you. But if you're someone who's grown up here, we hope this segment will be a wonderful resource to share with your new out-of-state friends. Which with that said, John, do you want to start us off by the different types of vegetable classes when it comes to kind of gardening and the seasons and stuff? Yeah, Tyler, I'd love to. So as many gardeners know, each plant type, from beans to squash, has its own needs and wants for growing. But generally, the average Idahoan garden can be broken down into four types. Year-round. So these are plants like citrus, figs, and more tropical plants. Generally, they grow in our summers, but if you grow them, you'll have to pull them in for the winter or grow them in a greenhouse for protection, which means you'll want to pot them. Yes. Or the second one would be warm weather. These crops are peppers, corn, watermelon, okra, and more. They love the heat. They can't stand a frost and won't even sprout if the soil is too cold. Then you have cool weather. These are crops like peas, spinach, lettuce, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. Uh, many of these can handle a light frost, and they actually generally prefer the cool of spring and fall. And then you have fall-planted crops. These are the weirdest out of the group. For farmers, it can be winter wheat, but for the average home gardener, they're carrots or garlic, and we'll cover more of those later. Which now that we have kind of a general understanding of the different types of plants in relation to how they sprout and grow and their affinity to different temperatures, you might be learning, well, how do I understand what that season is in my area? Well, thankfully, we have what are called hardiness zones. They cover the entire United States, and the zones give you an idea of the coldest that your area will get. The lowest in Idaho is zone 3B, which can go as low as negative 35. And the highest wow. is zone 7B, which generally doesn't get any colder than about 5 to 10 degrees. Most of the heavily populated areas of the state sit at between 6A and 7B. But if you live in more mountainous areas, you're more likely to be between 6A and 4B. There's a link in the description for you so you can look that up and kind of have a map to look at it more in depth. But as we kind of alluded to earlier, what are kind of some of the one-offs or exceptions when it comes to the weather as well. Well, this is where it gets really interesting. As someone who's not a native Idahoan, I've had to learn these rules. So there are rules and charts, and then there's Idaho. There are areas like Stanley where cold weather can come back at any moment, and there are others like Lewiston where you might always be tempted to just plant something. A general rule of thumb that should save you a lot of grief when planting your vegetable garden, especially with your more tender plants, don't plant until there have been at least two weeks of zero frost or temperatures dropping below 34 degrees. Idaho's weather is notorious for giving us a week of 50 degree weather after 20 degree highs. But don't be fooled. 
the next week it can drop right back down to 20 in a rush. So wait until there are two weeks of good weather before planting, just to be sure. The last thing to consider is that some varieties of your favorite vegetables may have done well where you came from, like me, but they might not actually work well here in Idaho. On average, please check your area. We have a growth time of approximately 145 days between the last frost and then the first frost. As a state, we generally have a shorter growing time than other places in the country. So when choosing which variety of peppers, corn, or other long grow time crops, check how many growing days it needs. You may not have enough. Right, and with all of this in hand, you might have the burning question of like, okay, you've given me all that, Tyler, but what time do I plant? I wanna get things in the ground, how do I decide? Well, kind of breaking that down into its general groups, you have cold crops. With those generally, you can plant those maybe in March is the earliest, but you wanna be doing it about the second week of April, save so about this time. Uh, most of those you don't wanna start indoors, but if you're in a more cold zone of the state, like McCall, Cascade, or somewhere in the more mountainous areas, you may wanna push that out to May for planting and stuff. Most of these plants that we're talking about are like spinach and peas. Um, the ones we talked about earlier, there are more of those cold crops. You can easily look that up, what they kind of land in. And specifically, one of our favorite plants here in Idaho is potatoes. They're on this list as well. You just have to make sure the ground isn't frozen. You can actually put them out a little further out than sometimes like your spinach or peas. Just has to make sure it's not frozen. You can put them in there and then they can come up kind of after that point. They can kind of mature there. You can do some hilling. You can read about that. We're not going to go into that depth. But generally the rule that I know that's usually set around the state is you want to plant your potatoes a little bit after Easter, which then on the inverse side, you have warm crops. These are the ones you want to have use the two week rule with the cold ones, not as much. I mean, you definitely kind of want that a little bit, but they can handle some light frost, just not heavy frost, but your warm crops can at all. Those granted, you can start them as early as January to kind of get a jump on it even more. So I've known some people that will start their tomatoes inside and get them growing and different stuff and then they'll put them out. So by the time they're putting them in the ground in like May or June, depending on the time of the state, they already have fruit on them. But to do that, you kind of have to have the equipment to do it, some grow lights and heat pads and different things to sustain them that long. Certain ones you can't do that with. And it can be an art to judge that. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can always go buy starts at a grocery store. But when you're buying them at the store, generally these are the ones you're gonna want to kind of use that two week rule that if it hasn't, hasn't frosted for two weeks, then you're good. But if it if you're not quite at that two week, don't just, just, just don't do it. <laughs> also for those that maybe aren't quite as experienced with gardening, there's certain plants such as like okra or corn or stuff that you can't transplant. You just can't early start it. So you can't kind of cheat that system. Sometimes what you can do is that if you've got a certain variety of pepper that you really like or tomato that just you can't find any other variety that doesn't have that taste, you can start it earlier indoors and then get it out so you can cheat that growth cycle here in Idaho. But if there's a specific corn or okra, which you can look those up, um, I have no doubt there's tons of resources online for that. You're not going to be able to cheat that and you're going to have to have a variety that kind of fits within that uh, grow time that we have here in Idaho. And then the last one is fall crops, which are a little bit more of the unusual ones. And there'll be some exceptions here. Generally, that's like your garlic, carrots, peas, spinach, and possibly Brussels sprouts. As we said, peas and spinach, they're in that cold crop uh, group, but you can actually plant them again in the fall if you time it just right. So like kind of, I know here in the Treasure Valley is where I have more experience, but you can plant them in about like September-ish because the temperatures are starting to decrease from that summer high and you can almost get a second crop out of them as we kind of mm -hmm. decrease in those temperatures. Same with the peas, if you can just time it right. So they kind of end up in that fall crop category. Also, there's carrots, which they generally end up in that cold area that uh, that we talked about earlier. And they can be planted early in the year. But I've actually found that in some cases, it's better to plant them in the fall, let them overwinter, and they'll germinate better just naturally with the spring rains and everything than they will just trying to plant them right at that time. Especially also, if you're a big carrot eaters, just leave one of your carrots to go to seed, kind of a tip here. And you'll never have to worry about planting carrots ever again because they actually reseed seed themselves pretty well I've noticed here in Idaho. And then the other one is Brussels sprouts, which are kind of the funnest and weirdest about them is that you kind of can, if you can plant them in that September, um, October period where they have some time to mature because they like the cool temperatures to grow. You can sometimes here in the Treasure Valley, I don't know how it would work with like a zone 3A, um, but you can actually plant them and grow them almost all the way to November or December that you can be picking them off the plant um, to have for like Christmas or different things. It just have to get that timing just right, but they're more of a fall crop you plant because their growing time doesn't really work that well here in Idaho in the spring. And then the last one, which is, I would say also unique is garlic. 
Uh, they're similar to carrots. You want to plant them in the ground when it isn't frozen, but you want to plant them in October so they don't start growing. So you want to put them in the ground when it's not frozen, but no no growth. We, you don't want that at all. And then you want them to overwinter and then they'll come up in the spring and they usually do really, really well. Fascinating. I, one of the, so living down in New Mexico, we grew a lot of tomatoes and a lot of peppers and peppers loved New Mexico. Man, it's fascinating looking at the the various different crops that actually grow well here. So we, we bought property here several years ago and we've planted more and more stuff year after year. And so I'm always excited come this time of year to start talking about and thinking oh, yeah. about what we're planting and how we're planting and what are we thinking. And so this is this is always an exciting time of year for us. Yeah, spring fever. It'll get you. It gets me every year and it seems to only become earlier <laughs> as the earlier years go every by. Year you get older. Another one that's really interesting I didn't cover in here, and this might be for someone who's a little bit more advanced in their gardening skills, um, and a fun fact, by the way, wink, wink, um, but the Pacific Northwest, and Idaho helps out with this, um, we are the world's leading producer of hops. So if someone's drinking beer over in England or something, there's a good chance that the hops that were used to brew that came from somewhere in Idaho, Oregon, or Washington. Uh, if you want to go see them, the the process of growing them is really cool. There's like these huge like lattice structures they build for them. Um, there's a lot of them over out in Wilder and the Greenleaf area. But if you want to grow them, they're actually fairly easy. They're a vine. Um, the easiest way to do it is if you've got just some big poles, you run it, and then you can have some lines go down it. Or you can, they're a seasonal thing. Once the frost gets them, they go away. So you can grow them over the side of your house, and you don't have to worry about them per se, unless you do it repetitive seasons about damaging your shingles. But they are kind of a, a cool thing to grow. And even if you're not going to use them for beer, there's other resources you can use them for. But they seem to do fairly well here in Idaho. But in general, I wanted to record this segment for you guys to give both those that are new to the state kind of a leg up on knowing what needs to be done with planting because it is that time of year we're kind of getting into. Obviously, this segment is a little late if you wanted to start starts, but you can obviously go buy that at different nurseries and places around the valley that will gladly give those to you and you can kind of get that extra jump start there. And also to be a wonderful resource for people who have lived there their whole lives, but maybe they have a family member or a friend that's moved in from out of states that wants to start a garden that you can share this video with them and it'll kind of give them a, a good jump start of knowing <laughs> where to get started and the do's and don'ts to be aware of. If you do think of something else other than what we've already stated that would be really pertinent for people to know, maybe it's some regional thing that I don't know about because I haven't gardened up in Cascade or in the Sandpoint or other areas, please leave it down in the comment section below. And I think I might be able to pin multiple. If not, I will like or heart or whatever else they, they are or what those things are to help people out. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we it's better to share that information because it helps everyone, especially those that are coming, that are trying to integrate, that are trying to... One of the things here in Idaho that we're really known for is we're rural, and that's what I think a lot of people come for. And part of that, they want to be like, oh yeah, I want to do gardening because maybe I came from a big city and I can only do pots or different things like that. And so they want to come here and giving people those resources to hopefully do that and integrate or maybe do things at the farmer market, I think is a, a really wonderful thing. But with all that said, thank you for listening to the entire show. I sincerely hope you found it enjoyable and valuable. If we missed any important points or provided incorrect information, please feel free to reach out to us via email at localyokelidaho2022 at gmail.com or on Twitter by tweeting me at localyokelidaho. With the small team we have, we're not able to cover everything, but we do our best to cover the most interesting and important stories. Thank you for your continued support and assistance. That's all for now, and I wish you a fantastic rest of your week. Godspeed.